Hi everyone, and welcome again to my audiovisual channel. I am Gabriella Handel, a draftsman and the host of the show, A Conversation About Art. During each episode, I look for the meaning of art and beauty through conversations with colleagues in different artistic fields. Today, I bring you episode 55, and I will have this conversation with artist Kevin Scott David. If you'd like to support this channel, liking, leaving a comment, and sharing this video is incredibly helpful, and so is subscribing. These three are immediate and have no additional cost to you. If you'd like to support my channel with money, you can do so by purchasing my drawings directly from my website, from the Contemporary Figurative Art Online Gallery where I have a selection of drawings, buying, thing, buying things I make on eBay, buying prints of my drawings, or leaving me a tip. These are all quite helpful in keeping this podcast and my artistic work going. The links for all of them are in the show notes. Thank you very much for watching and or listening and enjoy the episode. Okay, Kevin Scott Davis, welcome to my podcast, A Conversation About Art. You are episode 55. Please tell our listeners and viewers who you are and what you do. Thanks, Gabriella. No, am I pronouncing your name right? First yes. things first. Gabriella. Yeah. Okay. Um, my, my name is Kevin. Uh, I'm an artist and musician, um, uh, originally from Northern California, um, kind of found my way back into visual art over the last couple of years, doing a bunch of drawing after having not touched it for about 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, so my, my artistic career path has been focused on, on music for the most part. Uh, I went to college and got a degree in music composition. Um, a million years ago and now that i'm <laughs> old and tired i've been <laughs> sort of exp uh, exploring some new avenues and when i was a child i really i just drew all the time that was my thing um so yeah you're kind of meeting me um at an interesting point i feel like internally i've always always been an artist and um i've just been working with sound for so long but have recently rediscovered um, a place that it very, very much feels like a return home to me with the, mm. the visual art. So I do uh, music as Glowworm is the name of the, the project. And that's a band with myself and another um, musician, pianist, who is from Poland. Um, and we do long distance writing and recording mm. and albums. We're working on our second one together now. So mm. that's that half. And then, um, yeah, I, I, I draw for myself right now. I'm a, I'm a baby. I'm a beginner, but I've really, really fallen in love with it and uh, have really had a good time looking at your work, by the way. Oh, thank you. Uh, beautiful. Yeah, I, I, um, I find your work enjoyable as well. Um, it has, um, I don't know, like, a, I mean, I, I want to, like, the term that comes to mind is like a caricature sort of feeling, like a cartoon sort of feeling, but it's not exactly that. I just yeah. mean, like, there are some, some, um, you know, e like, liberties, I guess, quote unquote, that you take with proportions and things, but then at the same time, it doesn't, you know, it's done in a way that the rhythm of the, of the proportions is still maintained. Um, and so, I don't know, I just, uh, I find the drawings enjoyable and I also like what you do with the surface and the, you know, the degradation of shadow and tone and it means a lot coming from you. Thank yeah, you. that yes. you're academically trained, right? Did you, you study at the, at New York, um, New York what? Academy of Art. Yeah. Academy of Arts. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Um, so yeah, you, you, you nailed that on the head. Um, I, I think I just became aware of that recently, how illustrative my, drawings mm -hmm. are and that's mm -hmm. just something that's kind of coming out naturally um because I, I i was really into cartoons and comic books when i was a kid and stopped drawing around you know age 15. Mm -hmm. um so when i picked it back up again in in 2021 i think i i just picked up right where i left off okay. and um so so much of that is still in there but um i'm very much in, interested in realism i think there's just so much of that left in me right now that it's kind of a strange beginner's blend of the of the two for sure yeah yeah I think I think you're on the right path I mean uh you know because I mean as long as long as you kind of just keep doing it you're just going to find your way because you know just the way that you found like those liberties that you take with proportions you're 
uh, you know, because one finds those things little by little. Like, for example, I found my proclivity for the long necks uh, yeah. drawing from life. And, and then I noticed the tendency that I tend, you know, that tendency of mine to draw the necks longer than what they looked in real life just because necks are cool. And um, then I was like, one, one, once or twice, I kind of like allowed myself sort of to lean into it and kind of play with it, you know. And so like then it's like, oh, I, I started feeling more confident doing that. So you'll, you'll find your way, you know, you'll find little things that work each time or something. I mean, you know, I'm not trying to like sound preachy or anything. I just think it's cool no, where you're no, at. Because, yeah, it's like I, an I was really excited to talk to you today <laughs> because I'm really hungry for these kinds of conversations right now as a beginner and one who's not been um, trained in art in any type of school. I'm, you know, floating out here on my own. So um, yeah, I've been talking to a lot of different people. People have been so generous with me, but um, that was, I was flattered you, you'd want me on your show for whatever reason, but really it's an excuse for me to, to talk to you. And I hope to get in a couple questions myself. So <laughs> sure. I'll save that for later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, uh, I looked, I, I don't know. I looked at the drawings and I liked them and, and, and well, I like the fact that they're drawings because, um, you know, because of the way that drawing has developed versus painting. And this is actually a, a conclusion that I reached only recently, because I don't know if you have this perception, but um, in the art world, in quotes, um, painting and sculpture have kind of a, it's like, okay, so drawing is considered foundational. Yeah. Like very important. Yes, you must draw if you want to paint and sculpt, you must draw, learn how to draw. But then when it comes to finished work, quote unquote, it's like, uh, I have this perception that painting and sculpture have like a superior place to drawing. And the reason, and like my hypothesis for that is that, um, you know, obviously a drawing is very fragile unless you fix it with spray fixative, okay? So, and I mean, paper will last. We obviously have paper from uh, Leonardo da Vinci and whenever, you know, like very old stuff. Um, but you cannot touch that freaking thing. You can't. Right because it's you're gonna, yeah. yeah you're gonna you're gonna ruin it so it's like the ability to fix drawings was only really just coming what's just barely we were just barely you know humans were barely just talking to talk about it around like uh albrecht durer's time so like right. the ability to fix drawings is very very new and painting and sculpture are very very old you know so it's like drawing yeah. kind of has to compete in a way it's like we it, it like has to settle into the collective conscience or conscious or something that uh, now we can fix drawings and now a drawing is a little bit more resistant. You know, you can frame yeah. it and uh, you know, this kind of stuff. It's pretty interesting uh, like that. How so that you, psychology So you works. think that there is hope still for drawing to evolve um, as far as in people's consciousness as a, as a validated or more validated art form. I, I oh, mean, yeah, I think for sure. it's becoming so. Uh, I know. I know. Graphite has has kind of earned itself a reputation that it, it didn't didn't really have. Um, you know, I'm speaking from just little things I've picked up in my few years, but um, you don't think it has to do with uh, the fact that it's monochromatic? Oh, well, of course, sculpture is in a way as well, but you know, I think color gets uh, the limelight a lot of the time. And, and yeah. sometimes I feel like that's why people just assume drawing is a stepping stone on the way to painting. Um, and I'm going to out myself here, but <laughs> I, what I really want to do is paint. I would How love How dare you? <laughs> I know. And you, are you still, you still want me on the show? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but here's, here's my, uh, here's, here's what I hope saves that is that I, I had no idea. I didn't expect it, but I had no idea how much I would actually fall in love with graphite mm -hmm. as a medium. I've come yeah. to appreciate it as a medium in itself way more than I thought I would. Mm -hmm. um, I've always enjoyed drawing. Um, but you know, like most people, I kind of started out with my felt markers and stuff like that, or my, my microns and, you know, doing pen and ink stuff, which is cool. But, um, it wasn't until I switched to the simplest possible utensil, you know, the, the, it's kind of the lowliest utensil in the world. that I really, really started to see the, the magic, um, after multiple layers that it can produce that no other, no other medium I think can. I know you know that. So, yes, underappreciated, but on its way forward into the consciousness of man. <laughs> yeah, no, I definitely think so. And, um, um, uh, yeah, I that's that's a, that's an interesting point about the preference. Um, I mean, uh, as an added point to the the kind of like perceived preference for painting because of color, even like paintings with like muted 
um, muted color that are a little bit less chromatic and stuff. And, I, and I, I, that makes a lot of sense because, I mean, I'm not going to lie, I think rainy days and gray days are cool and everything, but wow, nothing beats a sunny ass day, you know? <laughs> um, and, and at the same time, it's like, I, I personally, in terms of uh, drawing and painting, I mean, I have a very strong bias towards drawing. It's like, I mean, I have painted and everything, but it's like, I just don't like to get ready for painting because uh, you have to, you know, all the colors and oh my God, all the pencils and then oh my God, washing yeah. all that stuff, forget it. I, it's yeah. no, it's like I already uh, right. put things off enough and it's like a drawing is very straightforward and I just love, I just love making that smooth surface and then like having some really strong marks and stuff and like that relationship. I really enjoy that. Yeah. However, um, when an artist, and I wonder how you feel about this, I wonder if you've noticed about your own tastes, uh, artistic taste. When an artist makes drawings and paintings, I favor the drawings. Uh, oh, that's interesting. So, yeah. You mean to say that most times when the same artist does one of each, you'll prefer the drawings by that yes. artist? I seem to like the drawings more, yeah. I, sometimes I feel that way too, and I question that because I wonder if it has more to do with the fact that that's what I'm immersed in most of the time, and so that's kind of what I'm preoccupied with. Yeah. But... To push back on my own statement there, I, I agree with you that there's a immediacy to drawing and a fragility that is really, really beautiful. Mm. Paint is richer. And um, like if you were to compare it to a dish of food or something like that, sometimes oh, yeah. you don't always want that deep, deep dish. I mean, I love paintings. I, I, my, some of my favorite art is, is paintings. I wouldn't say that I like drawings over paintings but drawing does a different thing mm -hmm. as you know and um there's no lies in drawing and you know mm -hmm. a line is a line is a line and and you can't get around that with drawing for me though um but i'm in love with even more and i'm allowed to say this because i don't i'm not selling any of my work but <laughs> um is the process of mm -hmm. drawing um you know I don't know if you want to go this direction if I'm stealing your questions away from you, but the, what no, I was well, going to say is that the, the single uh, most frequent thing people say is, I, I can't believe your patience. How do you have that amount of patience? Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. And it's never been, I kind of want to, I kind of want to push back every time a person tells me that because I've come over from music where for me, a single song <laughs> from the, the writing, recording, you know, mixing and mastering could, could take me, sometimes it falls apart and never gets finished. So it can mm. take six months and then never get done. Sometimes a song you'll get lucky and it'll take a month. But when I moved over from music to drawing, I I, I was amazed that I could get a work of art done in a couple days, a week, mm. Mm. a month even was not too bad to me. And so that's kind of where I come from. And I just don't feel that, um, I think probably as soon as I start playing with paint, um, and maybe this is why I'm kind of holding off. I think it'll probably spoil me for the, for <laughs> you know the, for the drawing. Of it. Yeah, but um, to be in it, I think is very meditative too. And mm. so the length like, of time it takes is something. It's a feature, not a bug. Is what I'm trying to say. Yes. Okay. Um, all right. So I want to ask you other things about your relationship with art in general both visual art and music so sure. um um okay all right just give me a minute um why why did you leave drawing all right no wait all right just give me a minute is this that i want to ask you one just right. uh there's not really that much time um okay um what what um how does music work for you as a as a as an artistic expression versus versus drawing as an artistic expression like um because i'm thinking of it as two different mediums like you know painting versus drawing for example uh they're different because you can say different things with each one so what kind of it's like i mean you know when you feel like music making music why do you feel like making music and why do you think that that impetus, impetus wouldn't work for drawing. And then when you want to make a drawing, why do you, why do you think that you turn to that uh, medium of expression that you think would not be able to be expressed via, via music? So uh, does that, sure. yeah. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, uh, 
I wish I wish I could lie to you and say that I've been set up with both practices at the same time for long enough to really have a handle on that. Mm -hmm. But for me, uh, currently, it's more of a struggle. I was really burnt out on music when I kind of needed a break and um, took, you know, started drawing. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is that there's a freedom in drawing for me that there isn't in a lifetime of being a musician. Mm -hmm. Part of it is just the sheer fact of being a beginner at something and not having to feel like you have to do something up to a, up to a certain standard mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. professionalism. Mm -hmm. yeah. So my, mine's a bit lopsided. My answer to that question is a bit lopsided because to me, music is my work and drawing is my... It's a little more than enjoyment. It's becoming a little more than enjoyment. It's, um, but I have it guarded mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, very fiercely. It's a place of refuge for me. Mm -hmm. Music's not that for me. Um, so to, to answer your question, to get a little more on topic and try to help you out here, I think I go to music when I'm more interested in um, expressing just pure emotion uh i think the listener is hit emotionally in a way with music that maybe with art is a little bit different um i've been thinking about this lately and i feel like now that i'm 42 music to me is something different than what it was when i was 25 which mm -hmm. is that <laughs> and this might be because i'm on medication and I can't I'm not young and I don't I'm not as raw and and um emotional but things are a lot more up here these days do you know what mm -hmm. I mean yeah and when I see a really beautiful drawing you know it's not moving me in quite the same way that music does um in ju just in terms of emotion it's I, I'm having a hard time putting my finger on this I don't want to say that drawing is just more intellectual that that's I think um simplifying it a little too much but there's a bit more <laughs> um i'm floundering a bit i i personally i draw when i want to de-screen de-technology mm -hmm. um, hide away meditate and spend a serious amount of time contemplating an object or a person mm -hmm. and i i've said this before actually in another podcast but I guess that makes it true um taking the time it takes to go around every contour of an object mm -hmm. from start to finish and then you know all the light and shadow and stuff like that by the end of that drawing I think you're really changed and hopefully in that process on the other end you've left that uh experience um there for the viewer to read and of course, visual and musical languages are completely different. Music is different in that it is a time-based art. And so, um, you know, you hear it in a uh, uh, limited amount of time. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something something therein that um, has to do with the emotional aspect. I'm going to just cut myself off there because I think I'm rambling a bit. Um, but I hope that... <laughs> But that helps to answer your question uh, at least a little bit. I go to a drawing when I want to meditate and be primitive in a way, mm -hmm, apart mm -hmm. from the technology. And then I sit here with my music production equipment and you know my mixers and my synthesizers and stuff like that when I want to work. And it's not fun, and I don't enjoy it. But on the <laughs> other end, <laughs> on the other end, it's incredibly rewarding to touch um, people's hearts if, if you if you get lucky and you're able to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, I didn't think that was rambling at all. Uh, I, I I definitely find it really interesting. I've only had I think one other musician on the podcast because uh, that's like a I mean it's you know music music is also a form of art as well. Right, uh, it's part of the arts, so. Um, that's definitely helpful. And it makes a lot of sense that you have a hard time talking, you know, uh, verbally expressing what you want to talk about in quotes with drawing versus what you want to talk about with music, because 
uh, even though you have done it in the past, you kind of you're kind of just taking it. You're just taking drawing up again. So that, I mean, I understand that that does make sense. And I mean, you still were able to tell me um, something of something on, on the subject anyway. Um, and you know, I also personally find the relationship between music, between uh, <laughs> I don't know, auditive art, and uh, it sounds like a modernist word that like Yoko Ono would use, but uh, whatever. Um, uh, like, you know, stuff that you listen to versus stuff that you look at. Yeah. Um, and um, Kandinsky, um, he wrote essays that I have never read, but I know of the essays, where he talks about the parallels between music and visual art. Because, for example, one parallel that always comes right uh, to the top of my head is like the way that two colors relate to each other. Uh, like if you put like red and green yeah. next to each other, they look in a way. And then if you put like yellow and red to each other, like the red looks diff, you know, it, it, it gives, it gives the impression that it looks different next to yellow versus what it does on its own. So like, there's something similar to that with like notes of music. It's like, if you play a, a music note on its own versus when you play it right next to another one or like both together, uh, it sounds different. So like, that's really yes. quite interesting. That's exactly right. And concerning the spiritual and art, I think is where you're quoting that from, right? I it's have no stuff. idea. It's really good. <laughs> and, and, that, and that is exactly right, what he says about, you know, and, and I would go even further and say that a um, a value, if you're talking about just drawing, mm. doesn't really mean anything until it's next to another value. Exactly, yeah. So yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, there's, a, there's tons of, I didn't mean to... I didn't mean to hate on my music at the moment. You can tell maybe I'm just a little bit old and <laughs> I've done a lot of it. And so I, I'm definitely in a honeymoon period with the art right now. And so I'm all about it. And the music comes with a lot of, um, whenever you have a lot of expertise in something, for me who has struggled with perfectionism, I think it, that alone can bog you down if you're not in the right yeah. mindset. So music is without that. Or, I mean, drawing is without that for me right now, and it's very liberating. But there's, I found that that it is just different mediums. There are so many similarities, just like Ken Dinsky said. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I mean, I did. I mean, I um, I, I didn't mean to insinuate that you're like hating on music or anything. Uh, and I didn't necessarily get that impression. The impression that I get is that maybe you're a little bit, you know, like you said earlier, you're burnt out and you're tired of it. You need a break and you want to try something else. And it's like really, it's rather common for an artist indeed to you know if we're just talking if we're talking only about visual arts either way like i have um a handful of episodes for sure where the person is like yeah you know whenever i want to take a break from drawing if that's their main medium they go to paint and the other way around as well or they do sculpture or they do printing um you know because you know sometimes a person does something just too much or or forces themselves themselves to do something or they were obligated to do something by because commission work and then you know they, they need a break from it and they're you're just like it's you know cloying and you want to you want to taste something else right you know? and i think you do learn um one medium will inform another yeah. when you go back to it that other medium has taught you something that you can then take that's definitely true with my music okay um all right so um mr mr scott <laughs> no, Mr. Davis. You can call me Mr. Scott. Yeah. <laughs> Are they both your last name? All kinds of names. Actually, Scott is my middle name. Okay. Um, but I've had three dads. So, you know, it's kind of like take your pick. Okay. McAllister was my original name. I don't know if you've seen the movie Home Alone. Yes. Uh, you, you remember Kevin McAllister? Yes. We had that in common. Um, but no, <laughs> it's, it's Mr. Davis officially yeah. these days. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's 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 funny because like I have several names as several names and last names as well, but it's like um, it's just it's like you know they make fun of, in the movies about this, and it's really quite funny because I'm from Panama, and it's like a stereotype that in Latin American quote unquote the the women have like two or three names, like they have like two plus names, so like I have three names, three first, um, I don't know. Like a name and then two middle names. I don't know what you would call yeah, it. But I bet they're all beautiful and flowery. And, and well, beautiful. yeah, some of them are. I mean, mine are. <laughs> what are your other names? <laughs> Gabriella. It's uh, so it's Gabriella Isabel. My that was my mom's name and Elena, um, my grandmother's on my dad's side, my dad's side name. All, so, all beautiful names, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, um, yeah. Okay. So yes, let's let's get back to 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 the art subject, um, Mr. Davis. What yes. is art in your opinion? 
you just shot that one out there like it was not the meaning of the universe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, um, I've been thinking a lot about this because I knew that you had two questions on this show, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pretend that I have an answer, but I did kind of write a couple notes down today. Okay, lovely. I'm a, I'm a a writer and I'm much less articulate with this. So I'm going to sort of take a look at what I wrote here. Um, these are all things I really think. These aren't things that I'm just making up. Um, sometimes it's nice to to put a, a pin on them. I love doing these kinds of podcasts because it teaches me a lot about what I believe. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, yes. um, and I can't wait to hear your response and hear what you think too. But I have been thinking lately and this is subject to change, that um, starting with a basic statement that art is, is basically an act of bravery in the face of our imminent demise. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, in other words, you know, we all sort of woke up here on this planet um, not knowing what the end is going to look like uh, um, and not really knowing <laughs> well, much in between, to be honest. Um, I think we're really good at uh, sort of putting our heads down and forgetting, I mean, the masses, I guess, for the, the majority of us. Um, that is this crazy, crazy story that we're living where no one really knows um, what's going to happen at the end. We do know about death. We're all facing it and no one can escape it. And so death is destruction whereas creation is life right and birth creation and all these things and uh, you know art is fundamentally an act of creation so it flies in the face of that spirit of decay and and death um so i think art making is really broad and um, there's no one way to make it but it's, it's sort of a form of of redeeming our time um, another thing I've been thinking about a lot about lately is consumption versus creation. I think our society is consumed with consumption. Mm -hmm. Um, and the people that I talk to, a lot of my friends who are artists and stuff, uh, a lot of us, myself included, can't really put a finger exactly on why we do it. But the single most common thread that I hear is that people are doing it because it makes life worth living. It keeps them alive. It staves off depression. And the consumption? Um, the act of making art. Ah, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Consumerism is a whole other thing. But but it has to do with the moving in the opposite spirit. Um, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, it, it, it's a form of redeeming our time, which is, you know, whether we want to face it or not, hurtling towards our our death and um I'll, I'll leave it at that for now um i think there's a lot more to it <laughs> yeah let me let me look at what else i wrote here um i think it picks up where language leaves off which is why it's hard to talk about it in the first mm -hmm. place um because if we could we wouldn't need it do you know what i mean so I, it's like i can talk about it here on this podcast and sort of scratch the surface but um, art is a demonstration of the ineffable, which means we, we, it's, it's not something that you can talk about really. And you know what I mean when you experience a great work of art and it, there's a sublimity that, um, it, it reaches some works of art, not all, but we're all trying to, um, trying to see this, this, this crack in the veil, um, see out to <laughs> the more <laughs> the mm. um and when art does that it's just so powerful that we know it but it's hard to talk about it mm. i think those are along the lines of what art is if you're asking me i that is in no way shape or form the sum of it but yeah can i ask you what you think art is is that allowed on this um sure yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um so i don't know what it is which is one of the reasons for which i started the podcast um awesome. because i don't know what uh art or beauty 
I, I don't know what either of them are, but, yeah. um, and so, so that's, that's one of the reasons for which I started the podcast. And also because, um, I want to sell my work. <laughs> yeah. And so if, if, you know, if you're going to sell something, you have to like, believe, you know, I remember this from when I worked in the call center and I was trying to sell credit cards to people over the phone. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, you have to believe in the product and you have to be confident in the product and you have to understand and know the product and all of this stuff to then be able to talk about it and be like, Hey, why don't you like this rebuttals and things, you know? Um, and so my idea of art, because it's really, it, it continues to be an idea. Uh, I don't have a definition <clears throat> yet. I only have an idea of what it is or what it could be. <clears throat> um, was so like the idea that I had of art was contaminated by postmodernist sarcasm and irony. So, uh, you know, when we talk about stuff that came basically, uh, I mean, not exactly after Marcel Duchamp and his urinal, right. but kind of after, you know, Dadaism and anti art and whatever it is. And it's like, you know, I kind of, you know, in the past, I thought that I had to put up with that and be like, I mean, I guess, you know, who am I to judge? And it's like, fine, I guess I have to put up with my drawings, which I love sitting next to a banana and a duct tape and a wall. And then my drawing has to compete with that. And, and but then it's like, now it's, you know, now I guess I'm sort of giving myself permission to be like, no, I don't have to think that is art. And I right. don't have to accept it as art. And that is beneath my drawing because I put, because of the work and dedication that I put into my drawings. Um, and obviously there is no such thing behind um, uh, ban uh, duct tape banana. And it's like, you know, Marcel Duchamp did a thing and that was cool for the time, right. but it's like, it it's, you know, become frustrating that um, the perception that I have anyway, like that's what I think that artists are trying to just reproduce over and over again, like that shock, instead of trying to produce profound emotion via lovingly made work. Right. You know, so it's like a shortcut where you get rid of the lovingly made work that takes a lot of time, like you were saying, and then yeah. you get the shock. And then, oh my God, that's it. it you know, it's not yeah. the same. It's like one is McDonald's and the other one is the chicken that your mom made at home with love. Okay. It's different. Something right. like that. Um, so oh, you, yeah. you'll love this. I picked this up today. There was an article in the Guardian on Monday, I think it was. Um, about Nick Cave responding to, I guess a fan had sent him a set of lyrics that um, were AI generated and the mm. fan had, you know, entered in, um, write a song in the style of Nick Cave and he sent it to Nick Cave. He was getting a lot of people sending him this stuff and you, you're going to love his, can I read his response? Because I, I threw sure. this in my notes today because uh, I think it's a beautiful, I think you'll appreciate this. On the topic of AI art versus human human made art mm -hmm. um, this is part of the authentic creative struggle that precedes the invention of a unique lyric of actual value it is the breathless confrontation with one's vulnerability one's perilousness one's smallness pitted against a sense of sudden shocking discovery it is the redemptive artistic act that stirs the heart of the listener where the listener recognizes in the inner workings of the song in their own blood their own struggle their own suffering so he's saying without that his process on the front end of it, the blood, sweat, and and fragility of the process on the front end of it, it robs that the art is robbed. Without that, the art is robbed with any humanness, which he mm -hmm. finds grotesque. And I thought that I thought that was interesting. And you know, you can make the same case for conceptual art or wh whichever uh, period of art that you. <laughs> got off the train for but i also think that you might be asking two questions uh -huh. there's what is art and then there's what art is art yeah you know what i'm saying so yes. and it sounded like to me you're kind of talking about which art is art yes yeah perhaps i think you're right yeah there's there's the co the comment that has come up in previous episodes is that you know what when you see it it's like some uh, senator or something i said that about porn when they were having some legal thing in the government about porn and he was like you know i know it when i see it um and uh you know heard that before yeah 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 it's uh i don't remember the names right now but um yes so yeah i think yeah i definitely think the going for the shock value 
is easier because it's not easy to make a thoughtfully make made work because uh, a thoughtfully made work has like physical work that you put in it has physical work it has time and in, uh, investment and it has a thought process that every mark that you make is an aesthetic decision that then informs the to, the collection of marks that forms the drawing that you're making so then right. it is not easy to calibrate all those little knobs it is not easy so then it's like making shock work and taping a banana to the wall it's like that is easy and stupid it's like anyone can do that and it's right. like so like the other thing about um what art is art um that's a really that's also a really good point because in a recent episode somebody told me this because i always make fun of moma because of the joke shit that gets in there and gets called art um so like so so this person was telling a story about how rauschenberg made a drawing and he gave it to another artist and the other artist erased the drawing because they had like a little kerfuffle a little artist kerfuffle um and so then that is on display as art so that got me thinking that you know and, and the guest was like yeah that's such a such great story and stuff and it's like yeah that's a great story like i agree because those guys are famous and shit or whatever and it's like oh that's like classical like uh, you know, if you really want to offend an artist, uh, you fuck up the drawing that they gave you. Like, that's exactly what you do. So it's like, you know, I feel that in the story. Anyway, right. the thing is that um, I feel like other things that are not art want to usurp the name of art because art is important. So, like, I, I, I have the impression that um, I have the impression that because we sense within us, you know, humans, everyone, because we sense within us that art is important, we want to ascribe the name of art to everything that feels important. So like, for example, yeah, so like, so like in the case of the, of the drawing that was erased, I yeah. don't think that's a piece of art. I think it's an art, I think it's a historical object. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that does not remove the importance from it. It's an, it's a, it's a, a art history object, but it is not a work of art. You know, so like, I think there has to be some desertion in that sense. So what do you think about that? I think, uh, I think you're making some good points. I keep thinking about what you said about Marshall Duchamp. Like that was, um, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Revolutionary at the time. Sure. But it doesn't, it does, there's not a lot of weight to it anymore because of the cultural context. Nobody cares if you were to do that today. Um, so is that art? I think, let's see if I can articulate this. Um, it's not to say that it's like, is philosophy art? If you're a really good philosopher and that is your craft, can that be your art form? You know, um, he wasn't demonstrating visual, uh, acumen. He was doing something different. So if we're going to call music art, we're going to call dance art, we're going to call spoken word art, we're going to, this is all included in art. And I think what we need to do, I think what you're interested in, it sounds like to me, is where to draw the line. Here, yeah. Here's the other end of the spectrum. I was talking to somebody the other day, and it, this spoke to me a lot because, like you said, my drawings are somewhat illustrative. They, they, they almost have a cartoony look for them, and I'm, I'm aware of that. Um, I'm okay with it for the time being, but like I said, I really kind of want to get to a point where I can attain realism if I want to, at least. But this person was kind of making the argument that that Greek sculpture, um, I won't name names, but this person was saying that they were at, at an atelier and the teacher was was modeling this cheek. And he was doing it so perfectly in a sort of uh, Greek sculpture sort of way. And she said, well, why did you draw it like that when it actually looks like this? And he looked at it and said, I did. I drew exactly what I saw. And she, her argument was that he was trying so much in classical, the classical idea of beauty, which this might segue to your next question, but um, that he couldn't even see that this cheek was idealized. And what she was telling me, and this gave me food for thought for the next week, was that anything less than the absolute truth is a lie and is therefore, at least to her, she wasn't preaching this like it was, you know, everybody needed to believe this. But so I'm saying all that to say is that where do you draw the line? If I idealize a form or exaggerate a proportion or I really like long necks, is that suddenly less art because I didn't do it right? If you're tape taping a banana to a wall, 
it's like the extreme version of not doing art right right mm -hmm. so where do you draw the line that's all i'm trying that's kind of what i'm trying to put forth and uh i'm with you on the whole conceptual art thing um there's an analog in music which is that for many many years i was i was really really interested in in sound art in microtonal mm -hmm. music, things like that. Things that would probably show up more in art galleries than in music venues. They mm -hmm. were very analogous to the conceptual art world. And the more, it's kind of like when you're into that world, um, it's kind of like an acquired taste. You're closest to that material. So you can see the beauty or maybe the intention behind these really sort of opaque, esoteric works Whereas the, the lay person would not be able to. And when a lay person walks into the gallery and sees the banana taped to the wall, they're going to think it's crap. It's, you know, my four-year-old daughter could do that, which is what everyone always says or whatever, yeah. which is absolutely true. But to a select and elite few who, who've experienced up to this point has dictated that their tastes arrive where they're at today within that specific field of conceptual art, that might be the greatest, most moving thing that they've experienced up to that point in time. It's still an act of creation, I would argue. But again, having said all that, I like drawing. I like I am, have embraced one of the slowest, most difficult mediums <laughs> yeah. because I much, much prefer seeing the um, process of a human being involved. And you and I both know that by the end of a 20 hour drawing or a 40 hour drawing, there's nothing left. You've poured everything into, into that subject. There's, I mean, there's no better way to, uh, to honor that subject than to go that slow. And this is, this is kind of what I'm doing right now. So having stuck up for conceptual art, I don't like it, but I was one of those people for many, many years who everything was, I was interested in the abstract. I actually think that the the paradigm is shifting. I think that, um, I don't know if, if you've noticed this, but I think it could make you feel better. I don't know if you've noticed the shift, but I think people are, are, are ex that we were experiencing a return to people interested in craft and tradition. Sure. And, yeah. uh, actual skill when it comes to art making yeah yeah there's definitely uh there's definitely like i don't know if somebody would call it a boom but there's definitely like a you know you can find at ateliers now like for traditional right. stuff whereas um lots of them yeah yeah whereas like i mean i don't know that much art history but whereas i think it was in the 80s um eric fischel who did figurative ish work <laughs> was like, oh my God, you're drawing the figure. What's wrong with you? That's old. Right. And it's like what he what he was doing, I mean, I, have, I haven't even seen that much of his work, but he was doing like rather insinuations of the figure. Like it wasn't even super rendered figures like uh, atelier style figures. It was like splotchy figures. And then people, people were still like giving him shit about it. And it's like, oh my God, calm down. You know? Right. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, what you were saying just, uh, I, I wanted to say a bunch of stuff, but um, for right now, what I remember is I guess it's really a parenthesis about the atelier person that you were talking about right now about how the teacher was like drawing the thing in a way and the student was the student was like that doesn't look like that and the teacher was like yes it does or something and um there's i think there's definitely an issue when you're trying to make representative work meaning that what you're drawing you want what you're drawing to look like your reference material whatever that is right um and i think there's definitely a problem um with trusting too much measuring and trusting too much like specific steps. Like uh, it's, it's practically stereotypical in the atelier that you're taught to draw the head in a specific way. Look at the ear and the measuring and you measure a million times to try right. to get it as accurate as possible. And like, and like the artist who does that is dependent on the measuring rather than on their eyeballs. Right. Um, and so they end up drawing, they end up drawing the concept of what they're trying to draw. It's like, I'm gonna draw on, I'm gonna draw Kevin's eyeball. I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to draw an eyeball. I'm not going to draw Kevin's eyeball. So right. There's a difference there. So like, I think right. that is probably uh, like, that is a, that's definitely a problem. And it's pretty irritating that the person is like, Oh my God, I'm drawing. I'm so good. <laughs> render, render, you know, and it's like, 
it's, you know, because they have relinquished the trust in their eyeballs to the measuring. And so like, yeah, yeah so like yeah. that, that's definitely a problem. So yeah, de developing trust and, and developing accuracy with your eyeballs in your hand is like really quite valuable in terms of what you want to make, even if you're not, even if you're not drawing from life, or even if you're not drawing from, from a photograph, if you're drawing from imagination, it's like developing that visual acuity to know when you have to move something around is pretty, it's, it's really valuable. And important yeah. to make that's something I really appreciate about your, both your, your videos. I've watched some of your drawing videos on YouTube as well, but your work is that it's obvious that you have some pretty high level academic technique under your belt. Um, but you don't let that limit you just like you're saying i mean you um make it work for you rather than the other way around and as a beginner you know i've learned a little bit about comparative measuring and stuff like that and it's really helped me out but i got to a certain point where i was like well how far down this road do i want to go am i going to lose my voice if i you know um continue with years of academic training or whatever and i'm kind of a both kind of a kind of a person and um, I think in probably every area of my life, I've realized that I, I think there's just an extreme on either side to everything. And sometimes for me, I just have to be like, middle of the road's good, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, that's kind of where I'm at with that. But I, I appreciate yeah. that about your work too, is that you're not, you're not strict in the sense that you're only doing what you learn in, in an academy. Sorry. Yeah. No, no worries at all. No, I, uh, I, I did. I didn't really have that much academic training. Like the only, I guess, that would go under uh, academic tra training is what I did at the New York Academy of Art, which was only two years. Um, you did a lot so, of anatomy, though, right? Yes, there was. I, I took a, um, almost any every anatomy class I could. Yes, uh, we drew a lot from life, also. That's cool. um, okay. yeah. Drawing from life is a fantastic learning experience and whenever you get the chance you should do it for sure just just for kicks yeah and i and i never have because um yeah i'm at a point in my life now where that's not even a, you know that sort of thing is not available in the city where i live and because i just started drawing um yeah it's unfortunate but i'll get there i, I yeah um, i mean no so you're saying that you just didn't you didn't do site size you didn't do um i guess i'm not as familiar with the new york academy of arts as i thought uh, i thought it was pretty pretty rigorous art program there but it's different than than atelier training is what you're saying it's different yeah it's different from atelier training there was i did side size for approximately approximately three hours and and that's about it i fucking hated it it was terrible uh, yeah i'm not particularly <laughs> I think there's so many more advantages to comparative measuring. So, you know, I see, I see a lot of people doing it, but yeah. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can, you know, you can find the, you can find the, um, what's it called? Like the syllabus. You can find the classes okay. uh, on their website if you're curious. And also, um, yeah, I mean, if you're curious about what, about what, what uh, they teach, you can find it on, on, on their website, but, um, yeah, so like the what the academy sells, what the New York Academy sells in quotes is like uh, what is it called? They have like a little motto thing that says like traditional training and contemporary discourse or something. Yeah. Um, so it's you know it's a little bit of, it's a little bit of both. I mean they're not super restrictive or dogmatic about doing a specific atelier curriculum. Yeah. Uh, but there is a lot of figure drawing from uh, drawing from life. There's a lot of uh, painting studies if you're a painting major. There's cast drawing if you're uh, a drawing major. There's a lot of anatomy the entire time. Like that's part of their curriculum. I mean, yeah, um, yeah. And I was also all right. So <laughs> I should ask you more questions because uh, time is passing by because the conversation is nice. <laughs> um, all right. Well, okay. Um, all right. What is beauty in your opinion? <laughs> um. Okay, I think it's uh, uh, you know, it's relation, it's relational. <laughs> it relates to art. Um, you look at my little notes from earlier. Yeah, I don't. I sound so stuffed up, but I. <laughs> so, I was thinking about this because I've never really known either. I love that you say you don't know the answer to these questions, and that's why you do this podcast. Because I'm just like you. I just want to talk to everybody else and find out what they think too. Like I, I would do something very similar to that. But what you've done is forced me to confront these questions this week. <laughs> and um, I think beauty is almost like a, a bad word these days in some yeah. sense. Like yeah. it 
unfortunately, we've both minimized it and kind of, it's almost like a bad word. I think maybe this comes out of the last, whatever, hundred years of conceptual art. Like, you know, cause tradition, the idea of traditional beauty is pastiche or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I actually think I'm kind of more of a traditionalist in that sense. Um, it's it's not far from that that I think that traditional notion of of the glimpse of the ideal. But that said, you know, every human being, every every um, viewer, if we're talking about visual art, is different, uh, which is where the saying you know beauty is in the eye of the beholder comes from, as it is subjective. So I would my answer would be, <laughs> I'm going back and form, reformulating, but. I think it's a glimpse of the ideal. It's that 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 glimpse of almost perfection, that piercing the veil in this life. None of us are perfect. We all know that. Uh, perfection is not attainable. We all know that. But beauty is when you catch that glimpse uh, of this sort of very close to, if not perfect, ideal. And I think ideal is also kind of, kind of um, spoken as like a nasty word too, but it, I think that just means you could put it in terms of in subjective terms, what, whatever is ideal to that, that person at that time viewing that piece of art. Um, I think beauty is fleeting. I think it's temporary. I think it's transient and that's why it's so attractive. So alluring. you can, you can apply this to many, many things. Um, there's a beauty of another human being. Um, you know, um, there's beauty in nature. And I think, well, there's something there because I think nature, uh, uh, let me see, I wrote something down about this. Rainer uh, Maria Rilke said um, to, to study nature, look close to nature, because in the same sense that we are constantly growing and struggling, it, it is doing the same. And um, I wrote a quote down. Excuse me, I'm falling apart here. <laughs> look to na nature. If you look to nature, the small details most most people see become great and measurable. Um, I think I wrote nature in this sense includes the, the human figure, not just trees, beasts, and waterfalls. Although we've never tired of any of those things, and so that, that says a lot. Nature might be the closest thing in to the existence of perfection we're ever exposed to in this life. Um, but nature, just like we are, is is on its way out. It's it's in a constant state of decay. Um, animals eat one another, and plants shrivel and die. And so, it, it's a it's a beautiful paradox. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, I yeah, I like somewhere in all of that. <laughs> what? Sorry. Sorry, sorry to cut you off. Beauty is somewhere in all of that. Yeah, no, I no, I was gonna say that I like I like that relationship of uh, beauty with nature a lot, and it's not the first time that it's been mentioned, and but it hadn't been mentioned in a while, which okay. is kind of it's kind of surprising. I'm for it. Yeah, no, absolutely, and I really like the idea of relating perfection to nature as well. Yeah. Or be, and the reason for that is because nature beats everyone in experience making stuff um in the sense that it's like yeah. every new tree every new leaf of grass every new little baby every new every new animal that's born however they're born all the different ones it's like nature has been doing that you know because we were talking about the creative act in um uh, when you were talking about art earlier yeah um nature has been doing that maybe not with maybe not not like with the artistic impetus that we think but it's still a creative it's still a creation of something she's doing it all the time right she's doing it all the time and she's been doing it for millions of years so she knows it's like it's like she has polished her creations for millions of years so it's like you know i and, and also what you were saying the quote that you said just now about i'll look to nature and something about the detail looking up close yeah, seeing things that, you know, most people don't see when you're looking at the details, the smallest details become um, sublime. Yeah, it's like, it's like if you look at a tree and you walk up to the trunk and then you see the bark and then it's like, 
it's endless. All the yeah. stuff that you can look at in the bark. It's like there's the colors, there's the texture, there's like there's like layers of bark, and then it becomes like the inside of the of the trunk and stuff. And it's like if you look at, at a um at a little bird, it's like you know, especially this tiny, these tiny brown birds, there's lots of them here in, you know, in, in the city in New York. And it's like, they're, they like go in the bushes and then it, the bush is like noisy because there's a bunch of bird, little birds in there. And then it's like, they're standing on the railing or something. And they're like standing there just being adorable. And it's like, they look like a little illustration. Yeah. And they're like being peep, 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 peep peeping, you know, and it's like, well, and some people yeah. spend their whole careers just painting birds, and that you know that's yeah, what and trees. Out of. Yes, yeah, and that's what I mean about spending the time drawing through every contour of that thing. You really changed by the end of it. I think I was just agreeing with Rilke. <laughs> yeah, what's the person's name? Uh, Rainer Maria Rilke. He's, he was a German oh, Rilke. Yes, yes. Poet. Yeah, he wrote letters to a young poet, um, which is great, by the way. There's just a literally just a set of letters he wrote to um somebody for advice to to a young artist it's great if you haven't read it yeah okay no i've heard i've heard the, the name rilke before i just um didn't i'm not very familiar with the person but um um okay yes no so yeah the relationship of beauty with art and perfection and as an ideal i like that a lot and it makes a lot of sense um and the fleeting aspect that you mentioned also makes sense because, you know, can you imagine if one was constantly just paralyzed by the beauty of everything? It's like you would never do anything and then you would not eat, you not go to the bathroom because you're just like, can't deal with anything right now because it's so beautiful. And so you just die. Because, well, see, you know, this is this is where, uh, um, see, I believe in God. Okay. And you're saying nature, I say God, and that, that's totally fine with me, but yeah. um, what you're saying right here is giving me goosebumps because if you believe there is a creator, and this is where, you know, um, it's fine if we, if we disagree, but I happen to believe there is intelligent design of nature and all mm -hmm. these things. So that's almost going a step further to say um, that that's where the perfection is, if you believe. And even if you're talking about God as a concept, I don't care, but talk about um, a cosmic perfection out mm -hmm. there somewhere, right? Mine is, I happen to believe in God, the creator, but however you want to think of it. Um, nature is the outpouring of this cosmic perfection that we are all actually truly one with. And this world, this planet that we live on is to some degree broken and dysfunctional, but nature is a really, really strong and good example of that crack in the veil of that. The, one of the only places that we truly see, and I don't just mean trees and bees, I, I mean us too. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Na nature is the human body. Nature is, yes. is us. Uh, you know that because you're yes. a artist so this is what i mean um this really excites me i love talking about this stuff but to me living on this rock and being stuck here um where the day-to-day -day can be pretty effing dismal I, I absolutely would not be alive today without this uh strong belief in that what we're all here doing as artists is working to peek into that beautiful place where everything is whole again, where everything is one again, where we're one with each other, where, where we're not at odds with each other anymore um, in every sense of the word, where things are pure life and there is no death and there is no decay. And that, and that I think for me, that's what beauty is. But on the other hand, you know, it can be that 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 cheek of that Greek sculpture too, a little bit. Mm -hmm. I or human beings, so we idealize too. You know. <laughs> yeah. No. And yeah. Also, the idea, the idea. That's going to sound redundant. The the ideal, uh, because you know whether you know, I I think it's great that you because um, you're it's Christian. You're it's a Christian God, right? I am yeah. a Christian. Yes. 
Right. So whether you're talking about about God or whether you're talking about nature, it's like they're both an ideal in the sense that, like you were saying just now, we're not perfect, but we're made in his image. So it's like right. as something that is made in his image, it's like we can still work towards that ideal. And so like, yeah, that's kind. I mean, I think that's kind of, you know, if, if you're an artist and whatever artistic expression, whether music or visual, if, if right. the pursuit, like if you're pursuing beauty or whether you're pursuing like any ideal, whatever ideal it is, whatever ideal it is, then, you know, it's something about traversing that difficult path because yeah. it's not yeah. easy. It's not right. easy. You're exactly onto it right there. Yeah. So like, so like that already is like, that is one of the best things that we can do. And it's like, that will give that, that will like, like that going through the journey and kind of fighting through the difficulties, you know, like, I mean, when you're making a drawing, it's like, you know, you're problem, problem solving the entire time trying to devise things. And it's, it's difficult while, while you're in the thick of it, but right. then the end result is like so rewarding and enriching and edifying. Yeah. Um, yeah. and yeah, it's like with, with each work of art, perhaps one could say that, that we're pursuing, uh, at least trying to imitate or convey that ideal of beauty or whatever ideal a person might have or perfection. Or what, or what it means to be here and be human. Yeah. You yeah. Know, um, I mean, to stay with the Christian theme, the Bible says to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And I, I, I very much think that's what artists are in the business of, um, you know, whether you, whether you believe in the Bible or not, but that, that's what Nick Cave was talking about. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's the, that AR, I art to him is uh, grotesque because it, it is the human struggle is subtracted from it. And I, I think that's what we're talking about. There is no perfection, not while we're here, mm. um, but uh, well, I, I was going to go down the road, but I know we don't have a lot of time. I think the, the sheer act, I'll try to sum it up. Dude, the sheer act of art making for a lot of people is um, saving. Yeah, okay. I can see that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, because without it, it would just be consumption and not the creation. Does that yep. make sense? Okay. Yes. Yeah, no, it's... um. I think that's why art therapy exists um, because, you know, we, we get to experience it all the time in the sense that while you're making the work, even though it's difficult and it, you know, you have trepidations and you're scared and it's like frustrating, um, you know, even, even in the case of your music and stuff, it's like, you know, you, you, you're like, oh, I have to keep up with something that I did in the past or it has to be better than that or whatever it is. Um, it's still, it's like, you still have control over it. You right. just have to, you just have to fight through these mental, whatever it is. And you find the thing. It just becomes more and more difficult as actually kind of, as you have more experience, um, as you uh, accumulate more experience. So it's like, I think that's why art therapy exists because it's like the person's life might be shit, but then it's like, if you are drawing, you have control over how this drawing is going to turn out. It's up to you how it's going to turn out. Mm -hmm. It's entirely up to you. So then it's like that sense of having the ability to control something. It doesn't matter what it is, but just anything. It can s slowly spill over to the other things that feel like, that feels like you have no control over. Yeah. Yeah. I think you just hit on Mm, that shift that I experienced going from, you know, being a little burnt out to uh, drawing. I feel better at the end of a drawing mm. than when I started almost every time. And it can be, it's, it's hard, you know, yeah. but it's always, it, it, it's always life-giving. It's yes. always rewarding. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. So, um, okay. So, all right. So Mr. Mr. Davis, we have reached the one hour mark. We're actually at an hour and three minutes. So I think we're going to close it out with this muse here. And uh, why don't you 
tell our viewers and listeners listeners what you're up to lately, where your work can be found. You have a project. Okay. You want to add anything? Okay. Thank you. Um, well, Glowworm uh, on Spotify is probably where I'd most appreciate people finding my music. Um, say what you will about Spotify, but they they help support us. And so it, it's G L O W W O R M, you know. Um, and I'm on Instagram. Other than that, uh, probably more so um, on my Kevin Scott Davis end of things. If you look up Kevin Scott Davis, you'll find some stuff. Um, and Instagram is kind of where I hang out, post my drawings, and post my complaints about learning how to draw and <laughs> all those sorts of things. That's where my community is. And um, yeah, that's about it. I, I do have a new album in the works. Hopefully that'll be out um, by the end of this year. I have a album that came out in 2020 that I'm fairly proud of. So you can go check that out too, called Midnight Intervals, which is about the dark night of the soul. And oh. uh, yeah, it kind of has to do with some of our conversation today. So okay. thank you so for you, Yeah, of course. Those are in Spotify, you said? Yeah, uh, okay. anywhere that you can stream music, just look up Glowworm. Okay. Okay. That sounds good. I'll put the links for, for that stuff in the show notes for anyone and everyone interested and also for when I look it uh, up. So thank you, Kevin, for joining me. Thank you for your time, words, and thoughts. Thank you everyone for joining us. Feel free to let Kevin and I know what you think of this conversation in the comments. I encourage you to like this video and share it with any and all pertinent individuals as it helps the channel and this way more people can listen to these interviews. Finally, I invite you to subscribe to my audiovisual channel because I have more conversations scheduled. If you want to support Kevin, myself, this podcast, or all three, the links will be in the show notes. So thank you very much, everyone, and see you next time. Bye.